Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shobita Parthasarathy. I am Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, here, known as STPP, here at the Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. STPP is an interdisciplinary, university-wide program dedicated to training students, conducting cutting-edge research, and informing the public and policymakers on issues at the intersection of technology, science, equity, and public policy. One of the few pandemic silver linings is that we have a large audience joining us today because we can hold these kinds of events virtually. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about our STPP program, you can do that at our website, which is stpp.fordschool.umich.edu. Before I introduce today's event, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. First, for those of you interested in our graduate certificate program, we will be holding an information session on October 13th on Zoom. You can access registration details on our website and we'll put a link to that as well in the chat. Second, the next event in our STPP lecture series this year will feature Fatima Hassan, who's a human rights lawyer, social justice activist, and the founder of the Health Justice Initiative in South Africa. She'll be in conversation with Dr. Abdul El Sayed, policymaker in residence at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. That event will be Monday, December 6th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. And you can also register for that on our website. And now for today's event. Today, we're hosting an important conversation about the inter interdisciplinary and urgent matter of environmental and climate justice. Our featured guest today, who I'm very excited uh, to learn from, is activist Jacqueline Patterson, who is the founder and executive director of the Chisholm Legacy Project, which is a resource hub for Black frontline climate justice leadership. Previously, she was the senior director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program, and she's also a member of the board of directors for Greenpeace, the People's Solar Energy Fund, and the Hive Gender and Climate Justice Fund. Ms. Patterson has broad experience in researching and implementing programs focused on women's rights, food security, public health, racial, racial and environmental justice and policy, and has worked with stakeholders all over the world to advance causes of environmentalism, equality, and human rights. In conversation with Jackie will be Dr. Kyle White. Dr. White is the George Willis Pack Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the School for Environment and Sustainability here at University of Michigan, and is also an STPP affiliate faculty. Kyle studies environmental justice through a moral and political lens, especially in the context of indigenous peoples, rights and anthrop anthropogenic sovereignty. He's a member of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and has served as author for the US Global Change Research Program and Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors at Close Up, the Program in the Environment, the Environmental Justice Program, and the Center for Racial Justice for making this event possible. I also wanna thank our STPP staff, Mariam Nagaran, Isan Akhtar, and Molly Kleinman. So Kyle and Jackie will talk for about 30 minutes and there will be time after that for audience questions and engagement. If you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A function on Zoom. Kyle, Jackie, I am really looking forward to your conversation today and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and I'll go ahead and transition into a a first name basis. And so Shobita, thank you for all your work organizing this event. And also thanks to the STP community for working on topics and questions and ideas that it would be fantastic for Jackie to share their understanding and knowledge and experiences uh, about. And so I really look forward to this engagement. And as a Potawatomi person, uh, Jackie, I just wanted to welcome you virtually to the Anishinaabe territory. <laughs> this is a uh, a place uh, uh, in the Anishinaabe homelands, uh, often the Three Fires, uh, Ojibwe and Odawa and Potawatomi people. Uh, and it's a significant uh, place for, for many of our communities, uh, culturally and spiritually and politically. 
uh, and the University of Michigan significantly, as, as part of its founding, received uh, endowment from uh, uh, Potawatomi people in 1817. I'm well, looking forward, Jackie, to learning more from you about all of the, the work and experience that you have in these areas of environmental and climate justice. And I just wanted to start out by uh, asking you uh, about the Chisholm Legacy Project. Uh, I'd love to learn more about uh, what it's doing, what you plan to do with the, the, the organization, the project, and, and maybe a little bit of background on, on the meaning and significance of the name. Yes, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Kyle, and I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Um, yeah, so the Chisholm Legacy Project officially launched on July 1st of this year, and it's the name, it's named after Shirley Chisholm, who was the first African-American woman in Congress and the first African-American person and first woman to run for the presidency of the United States. And so she, uh, she, she really was the legacy that we would like to follow because the fact that she, throughout her, her leadership time, she up, equally up to, lifted gender justice and racial justice. So we saw during that time, a lot of folks who were, um, who were champions for racial justice and there was almost a unspoken, unspoken in public, but a very much uh, directive from the movement to say, like, look, we just need to focus on this racial justice thing. And so, and so she really rose above that and said, no, I need to be focusing both on gender justice and racial justice. So I appreciated her, her determination and her tenacity in the face of um, people encouraging her to do differently. I also appreciated her her tenacity as it relates to even when she ran for president, there were that she wasn't necessarily invited to the debates like other people. When she would hold a press conference, the the media refused to answer ask her questions because they just disregarded her candidacy altogether. So there's just so many ways that she just rose above. And not only with just kind of sheer grit and determination, she didn't allow it to 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 to, damp, to to steal her spirit. I mean, certainly I'm sure there were times when it dampened her spirits, but like when you see her in, in pictures, she is um, just as much uh, pictured smiling as she is um, otherwise. And it's not that kind of smile that you see on some people where it's just like kind of almost a gritted teeth, teeth smile. It's a genuine smile that she still was able to find the joy and the humor and, um, in, in spite of the opposition that she faced. So I appreciated that. And then I found out as, you know, as I had already admired her, but as I read her, her story more, I found out that like me, she has Caribbean roots with her parents being from Guyana and Barbados. And then I also found out that like me, she started off as an elementary school teacher. So that those are kind of some bonuses after I had already <laughs> decided that I really admired her. It's neat to find that we had followed similar, similar paths, so. That's kind of the origins of the name. And then the project itself, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, to answer that question, um, it has four main foci, and I can get into much more detail, but one is uh, community building, so supporting frontline communities in, in self-determination and leadership on environmental and climate justice. Two is movement building, so really supporting the movement so that it is a more accommodating space for black leadership and then also supporting the movement at large because when we all come together we all win so we do everything from training and certification programs to organizing affinity groups within the movement like our global afro descendant leadership initiative so connecting with people from the motherland people from you know the caribbean people from um, afro descendant groups in um in other nations, I mean, in um, Europe and so forth, in Canada. So, um, so that's one thing. Two is, I mean, then the third bucket is bending the arc of mainstream environmentalism towards equity and justice. So, so whether it's the Sierra Club or the National Wildlife Federation or in our National Resources Defense Council or others, really working on as we build the leadership of communities and as we work to strengthen and support the movement we also want to make sure that folks are equipped to be able to 
help some of these other mainstream groups to talk about environmentalism, to understand the intersections with, with environmental justice and climate justice. And so, um, so there's that. And then fourth is really supporting Black women's leadership. So again, the legacy of, of Shirley Chisholm providing to Black women in climate change what Shirley Chisholm didn't have in terms of support real support. I mean, she had great, like, I've, I've met, since we put out this intention, I've met a number of people who were on her campaign and people who were from her community and remember her and so forth. So, so she certainly had support, but really providing some of the, the supports that weren't even talked about back then, like executive coaching, leader um, respites, retreats, and healing justice and those kind of things that are, are pretty co critical in a kind of trauma-informed organizing that is critical in, in Black community. So that's kind of the work in a nutshell. That's an amazing and like powerful vision and set of practices you're bringing with the Chisholm Legacy Project. And it really hits me at a personal level too, just recognizing that for many indigenous communities, many Black and Latinx communities, you know, many of our ancestors, our contemporaries, not only were they environmentalists, <laughs> uh, but they were connecting environmentalism, you know, like you said, with other leading issues that were affecting them. And they weren't necessarily trying to categorize or separate things out. They were looking holistically and in complex ways. And I, you know, I'm really inspired by you know what you shared about this uh, next phase and your important work with the Chisholm Legacy Project, and just by the example of, of of Shirley Chisholm, you know, in terms of how many of our our communities uh, have been excluded from environmentalism, um, do you see that the the tide is beginning to to change, or are we still in a position that resembles uh, other periods when our voices weren't heard? Yeah, I would say a little bit of both. I mean, there's still a ways to go, but at the same time, there is progress. I mean, we're seeing everything from the the, the leadership and the administration around issues of environmental justice, as well as you know roles like so whether it's you know Michael Regan at, at EPA or Jolanda Baker at the Department of Energy or Cecilia Martinez at the Council on Environmental Quality and, and Deb Holland at the Department of Interior. So all of this gives us hope that, um, that there's some, some movement um, at, at those levels. And then also communities that are really starting to, to, to advance changes and, be, and, and, and begin to be the change that we wanna see in the world. So whether it is the Earth Seed Permaculture Farm in Oakland or the Black Mesa Water Coalition in, um, in, in Arizona, or it is the, um, or it's groups like the Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York, or the, the Bush and Steering Committee in, in Alaska, where I happen to be right now, <laughs> I'm speaking oh. to you. So uh, there's so many folks who are really, you know, just taking the lead and, and being kind of the, the, the torch, <laughs> the torch light. Um, so yes, so we're seeing some advancements from what we saw before. Jackie, that's great to hear about some of these these voices and these projects and just all the hard work that you know is out there uh, and just the diversity of knowledge you have about what important people are doing and how they're seeking to make change. You know, and given just the tremendous you know memory and kind of history you have you know available to you, and then all of your experience uh, you know working toward environmental justice, how do you? understand, at least for the sake of our conversation, you know, what we, we mean or what we should mean by concepts of, you know, environmental injustice or uh, climate injustice. Mm, thank you. Yes. So what we should mean, I mean, what we should mean when we talk about justice and what we do mean when we talk about injustice. Um, so, so we know that we, we often kind of put all of this, as you say, with the intersectionality under this just transition framework, which really talks about the society as it is, which is rooted in extraction, exploitation, domination. And it is that extraction and exploitation and domination that's at the, the root of, of climate injustice and environmental injustice, just like so much else. So extraction, the reckless extraction through mining that is not only harming lands and displacing people, but actually, you know, we know 76,000 coal miners have died of black lung disease since 1968, while the National Mining Association, which consists of their very employers, have fought against 
the regulations that would have protected their own workers from coal mine dust, not to mention the fact that we shouldn't have been doing the mining in the first place, but even that, you know. And so, um, so whether we're talking about that or we're talking about, I was out in Cayenta, Arizona, and, um, and, and I was struck when I was driving down the street by seeing a sign for, and I wish I had taken a picture of that sign, but it was for a, a health clinic for uranium mine workers. And the fact that there's like a health clinic, like it's so institutionalized, you know, that there's a, I mean, it's just uh, unbelievably appalling to me that anyway, but just, I'm glad I can still be appalled and that's not just accepting it as the unfortunate norm, but, but, um, but so you know, so we've seen kind of how environmental injustice happens with with the with the extraction, and the exploitation of the communities that are host to these extractive processes. In terms of seeing really those communities as being disposable, the people in the communities as being disposable, while while folks take advantage of the communities. And so this is all on the on the injustice side of the continuum. But then climate justice and environmental justice is on the other side. If we, as we stop the bad and then shift towards building the new of a living economy, which really centers caring for the sacred in terms of the earth, our, the, our relationship with the earth and our relationship with each other, um, that it really goes on principles of cooperation and uh, regeneration, which are really, you know, in resonance with biomimicry, like bio, uh, cooperation is how how nature exists and it's in its divine wonder, whether it's like the z zebra dazzles or the ant colonies, they all cooperate. Like that's the actual core of how it all kind of works. <laughs> so, so really, um, really mirroring our society after, after, after our ecosystems. And so the living economy also includes um, uh, not only cooperation, but also just deep democracy. And so that's the, the justice side. And that's what we as in climate environmental justice movement define as what justice would look like and what we're all fighting for. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, some of the, the contradictions that you mentioned, like in your example of the uh, of the, the health sign. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it, I mean, that just really sums up so many <laughs> things. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you could have talked for several hours about all the details and the history of that particular case, but when you're confronted with uh, those, I don't know what you would call it with that <laughs> image, that, <laughs> that tells us all what, what needs to be, uh, what needs to be known. <laughs> and, um, Definitely. Uh, yeah. And, and just feel for, you know, a lot of the, the situations that you described, the communities, the families, Families that are having to experience these disproportionate burdens of so many different, uh, you know, pollutants and environmental stressors and, and risks. And, you know, in, in the response that you um, had just shared with us, Jackie, you mentioned extraction and, you know, different extractive uh, activities, you know, including mining and, uh, and others. Um, do you, do you think that extractivism, uh, also extends in some cases to some of the solutions to, to climate change, uh, or are most solutions to climate change ones that are kind of using a completely different logic? Yeah, so this is, um, this is a, there's a quote from Martin Luther King I, I use in various presentations where it says, all progress is precarious and the solution to one problem can lead us to another. So this notion of solutions and who's defining solutions is where we find extractivism in some of the solutions that some, that false solutions that people are putting forward. So whether it is, you know, carbon, this notion of carbon pricing and the way it's being implemented, like like it's one thing to kind of talk about the cost of carbon and who's paying the cost as it stands with um, but also using that as a way to really engage in a shell game when it comes to carbon emissions and who and the people who are paying the price are the communities where you continue to extract like so if it costs less to to burn to burn fossil fuels in a certain community then that's the community that people all want to go to and so it extracts extracts from the community in terms of it's 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 healthy air it's healthy water it's you know it's a healthy community and then it and it and, and it uh you know sacrifices they call these communities sacrifice zones so it sacrifices those communities towards what what they're considering to be uh, emissions reductions in the 
in the aggregate. And so like when I was um, having a conversation about the clean power plan and, you know, well-meaning environmentalists on that call, mainstream environmentalists said, well, I think we can all agree that emission, that we all want emissions reductions in the aggregate. And I said, you know, I can understand why you would say that, you know, but no, <laughs> you know, so, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's sad because like for her, she really, it wasn't like she was like mean spiritly thinking like I'm gonna, you know, pollute these poor communities or anything like that. She just had no idea. She just innocently said that as if it was just a given, like, well, of course we can all agree to this. And so this is where, the defining of solutions um, and the and the perpetuation of extractivism can come into play. Um, and I could give multiple examples, but I'll start with that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate, I mean, what you describe, but also, you know, feel for <laughs> those particular types of conversations. I feel like I'm in that, that same type of room, you know, all the time. And, you know, it, it's really made me wonder, um, you know, Jackie, whether, um, you know, what type of um, crisis, uh, you know, are we really in with respect to climate change, you know, and, and what I mean is when we hear people coming back to these positions where it's okay to sacrifice many of our communities for the sake of protecting some sort of industrial order. I mean, that mm -hmm. just sounds like this, the thinking that people used uh, when they were trying to solve other types of issues in the 19th century and were perfectly willing to sacrifice Black communities and Native communities and Asian American communities and others. You know, do you think, Jackie, that, um, you, you know, do you think that it's, it's, it, it's important for us to uh, discuss or to highlight that the climate crisis is a different or a new type of crisis or, mm -hmm. um, Perhaps is it better to think about the climate change crisis in a different way that 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 focuses on some of the similarities between how uh, uh, privileged people and, and and racist people have uh, uh, you know sought to exclude and and to sacrifice many communities for the sake of their own uh, ideas and solutions? <clears throat> yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, well, so when um, COVID-19, when if, when the pandemic was first kind of, people start, were first starting to recognize that this was happening, I, um, like on March, the, I think you know, it was March the 9th, I was actually on a little vacation and um, in, in Mexico, actually, and uh, and and I started to read and kind of see what was happening, and uh, and I took... 19 hours straight on March 9th and wrote this document called the equity implications of the COVID-19 um, mm -hmm. pandemic, right? And so that was back when, you know, it was only like in that Kirkland nursing home and, and you know, it hadn't really moved at all, but that document turned out to be like, you know, all the stuff came to pass, right? And, and it wasn't like this prophetic thing, but it was, it was because of just what you said, like we've seen these patterns of, of inequities that are consistent no matter what the crisis is, whether it's the economic crisis, the racial awakening, not COVID-19, the climate crisis, it's the same pattern of systemic inequities that lead to the same pattern of, of um, of disproportionate impact and of kind of systems collapse, and so, and so at the same time, while um, while we so we all in the movement, like anybody who was in the movement, could have written that because we've all seen this playbook um, time and time again. And so, like on one hand, like you you kind of want to say to folks, like I told you so, like we this is what we've been saying all along, you know, as it, as it relates to each and every one of these things. But, you know, I told you so is never a particularly compelling way to get folks to take action, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's been going wrong when I've been, <laughs> that's why nobody ever calls me back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, it's very funny. Um, yeah, so, so I think, so I think to answer your question in terms of just like narrative and framing, it is like there's people who, who, who that's their kind of trade. And then there's those of us who are just like rolling our eyes and, you know, like you said, wanting to say, as I said last week, but anyway, um, so, I, so, so, I, so I guess that's all to say that in some ways it is important to like, there, there, there has been, I think a deepening of understanding 
and, and, and people beginning to kind of come to see the light in terms of these these patterns and how it's starting to kind of how the 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 tread is well worn on these on, on the tires along these this path and and so i think that there's kind of people who can who are close enough to understanding that you can kind of lead them along down that path to kind of say like yes don't aren't you starting to see this and then there's other folks who i think a different message is necessary um, or a different kind of way of like oh this is new brand new thing happening here you know so whatever it kind of takes to get people to take action i'm kind of all for at this point because we just need everybody to, to do something um, because yeah yeah and you know jackie one of the you know the main forms of action that you know a lot of people talk about especially from the standpoint of communities of color is you know grassroots action you know action from the grassroots actions led by frontline communities you know in your career and and and, and recently you know have, have you noticed any changes in what grassroots action means or or any uh, particular innovations. I know obviously you mentioned at the beginning some of the great work that you're doing with the Chisholm Legacy Project, but I was just curious like what your your take is. I feel like I never get a chance to really connect in a more reflective way about what do we mean by grassroots and <laughs> grassroots action and are, you know, is it as it's always been or is it you know going in some new directions? Are there trends that you're tracking? Yeah, thank you. So a couple things with that. I think that um, a similar to our the previous question that there is a, a bit more of a dawning reality that that grassroots action is the way is is, is and that grassroots leadership is what we need to follow. Um, and that I mean that is exactly why the Chisholm Legacy Project is doing the work in the way that it that it has. It's helping to build the capacity of the grassroots to really be at that helm of leadership. And so a community that might have a vision that they want to have clean air and clean water, our role is to work with them to help them to be able to figure out what the strategy is and what that grassroots, the most effective grassroots action is to move that. And so now we're seeing an increase, like whether right here where I am in Anchorage, they had a couple of years ago, you know, for the first time ever, a community advisory board that then put together the climate action plan here in Anchorage. And so that's that's an advancement. And so then in um, in Oakland, similarly, they had a community a community participatory process to put together their climate action plan. And so so yes, there's a, 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 a dawning realization that communities know what they need and that they need to have you know, again, with the words of Shirley Chisholm, when she says, when there's no sin at the table, then bring a folding chair. That's what's one of her favorite um, quotes. And so, and that's exactly what's starting to happen. And then we're starting to see the results in Portland, Oregon, the Portland Clean Energy um, Clean Energy Fund was as a result of grassroots action and the communities really wrote that bill that then, and then because they wrote that bill, they were all invested in seeing it pass. And so it, it became legislation and uh, one of the leaders then became a city council member. And so that's what democracy really looks like um, is grassroots action that turns into policy, that turns into leadership that that's truly represents the people on the front lines. Uh, so hopefully that kind of, <laughs> gets gets yeah. here yeah okay yeah no the, absolutely but the, 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 I, the, I have to say while you were you were talking i kept thinking we just need a class on the philosophy of shirley chisholm at <laughs> the university of michigan <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. you know, the philosophy and the practice and the leadership and just the model yeah. that you know they really set for uh people i mean i think students to <laughs> To, to, to learn from that, right? It would just be amazing. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> You're right. I agree. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I, I know I'd like to um, engage uh, our colleagues here who have questions. Uh, you know, I did, Jackie, want to also just uh, uh, connect with you uh, a bit more on the, the question of the, the, the role of, of, of industry, you know, the role of, of companies and corporations. You know, I know a lot of your career, you've been holding uh, private industry accountable. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, private industry for I mean, I guess for a number of different reasons, just holds a lot of power in energy and uh, climate change. 
uh, you know, are there strategies that advocates or members of, you know, communities that are deeply affected by climate energy issues, is there things they can do to change the, the, the power balance, the, the financial imbalance that uh, is associated with private industry and many corporations? Mm, thank you. Yes. Um, so one of the things, so I'll maybe take us on a little bit of a, a, a short trip here, but uh, so um, so as you may have heard, we wrote this uh, volume called Fossil Fuel Foolery. We had the first volume a couple of years ago and just did Fossil Fuel Foolery 2.0. It really chronicles the outsides impact that the fossil fuel industry has on our, our legislatures, our courts, um, even our communities and the ways that they've used some pennies to kind of buy the support of communities and so forth. And then we have the folks who, who have started to develop clean, quote unquote, clean energy and other types of, of, uh, of, of uh, enterprises that have followed some of the same, one of the major uh, solar companies um, bought, uh, used to use as a vendor, someone who used um, um, prison labor. And so when we talk about extraction and exploitation, the, the prison industrial complex really, you know, corners the market, the market on that. So when we um, challenged them around that, they said, oh, well, you know, if we, if we are, if we support this, then the prisoners, then they, they have a, 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 a skill that they can use when they get out. We're like, okay, that sounds semi-reasonable, at least in terms of intent, until we learn that they have a policy against hiring formerly incarcerated persons at their oh. company, <laughs> you know? So again, then we find ourselves not only having to push on fossil fuel companies, but having to hold the folks who are supposed to be the friendlies um, to the carpet in terms of their practices. But then we have groups like, you know, Patagonia that goes out of its way to support frontline um, climate justice leadership. We have groups like Ben and Jerry's that, that, are, that go out of their way to support local production, which is, is critical, as well as supporting causes with their advocacy voice and other in their foundation. So there's that whole continuum, you know? So um, hopefully that kind of answers your question, which I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that 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 makes a lot of um, sense to me, and just good to hear the way that you kind of understand and discuss these issues with you know private industry based on your experience and your work. Uh, and yeah, I, I you know, I, I just been um, uh, you know, or it's just been great to uh, kind of connect with you on some of these questions. I know they're ones that are important to the the folks here in the STPP community and. And certainly the audience is is very engaged and they have some questions <laughs> of, 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 of their own that I was going to uh, uh, give a hand uh, to give voice to. And so our colleagues uh, here in STPP have been uh, uh, working with the folks in the audience and are, have suggested some questions for me to, to uplift <laughs> from, uh, you. for you. And uh, so uh, I'm just going to roll with these questions. Does that work, Jackie? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, the, the first question is, and I'll read them slowly, okay. or, or it, it slowly, <laughs> the, the question slowly. <laughs> um, uh, is there a role for technologically innovative climate solutions in your vision for climate justice, uh, or are technological solutions inherently exploitative, uh, at least in practice? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So it's another one of those things where it's a mixed situation, you know? So we do have these techno fixes, which is everything from like, basically a giant vacuum to suck the carbon out of the air <laughs> to, um, to, uh, to carbon capture and sequestration which uh, you know has this notion of, of, of burying carbon in, in the ground um, to, to other like geoengineering. Um, yeah, <laughs> so there's <laughs> so much there. But then there's also kind of positive uses of technology like the, some of the sustainable building practices that allow buildings to be built, to be designed in a way yeah. that, that actually follows biomimicry. And so there's these awesome ways that, 
you know, they use ambient heating and they, 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 the shades kind of are, move according to the sun. And, um, and then there's kind of gray water um, systems and all of this in, in our building design, which does, does uh, take a, a degree of, of technology to, to work. So it's, so it's really all about like having some foundational principles in, in the design of whatever the, um, the technology is and to, to follow, you know, do no harm principles and, and, um, and, and, and to be, and to be attentive to, to ways that, that, that we extract and, and, um, and pollute and, and, and unintended consequences. So looking at the whole kind of supply chain of any type of um, technology, supply production, whatever the chain is that's associated with it. So that's all it's like not a kind of a no technology or no technology, but it's technology, how and what and yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like with a serious dose of humility and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. And we have, I have another question. Uh, how might we support young people, uh, especially folks from historically excluded communities going into and persisting in environmental studies, work and activism? Yes, thank you. Very good question. Yeah, I spoke at a solar energy industry association, I think the name of it, a, a SIA meeting a few years ago. And I was, anyway, after I finished speaking at their kind of luncheon, providing their luncheon keynote, these two young Latina sisters are people anyway they they walked up to me um, young people they walked up to me and one of them was in tears and said you know I've never heard someone talk about these things like you know she was in the solar industry but she had never heard anyone talk about what she does every day in a way that relates to the the, the concerns and struggles and possibilities even in her community and um and interestingly enough, there was another solar event that I went to where this person came up to me in tears. And she was in tears, significantly in tears. And she said that she had only gotten herself together. And I was like, if you call that getting yourself together, like what was it like before? Like she, was, <laughs> <laughs> she was really, you know, and that was after I had given, yeah, a little talk. And she also was just saying the same thing. Like our communities are hurting so much. And like you have now helped to contextualize what I do in a way that's different than I ever thought of it. And I think that um, I think that that's, that's the important thing that, that we need to do when we think about other communities is to help to contextualize. We, we wrote this thing called um, environmental intersectionality, teaching environmental justice in the classroom to help kids you know, who are you know, in EJ communities, but who are in school and learning about environment. And it was, it was basically saying, how, do you, how does social studies include environmental studies and how do environmental studies include social studies? from a real justice perspective. And so that's the way to like get kids to start thinking about it from when they're in elementary school and seeing it in a very different light that, it, that actually resonates with their community. So people think of like doctors or fire, fire folks or whatever as like helping professions. But if we recontextualize environmental studies in a way that actually is rooted in what's happening in our communities, and we have a whole new kind of way that youth are thinking about it. So that's that's what I would start with. And I would also say that we should make opportunities for youth where it's not just about how do we use youth <laughs> as interns or what or volunteers or whatever, but how do we design things so that we are from the time that youth are engaging as in whatever role as we think of them as the treasures that they are and the present and future leaders that they are. And so I think we need to start also redesigning on what opportunities that we have for youth to mm -hmm. as entry points into this work. I, I really love Jackie, just all the different ways you've talked about intersectionality. Uh, you know, I think probably from the beginning of our conversation today, I mean, we we're talking about so many different ways in which intersectionality informs meaningful action and just all the different ways in which it can be meaningful. I mean, that's really powerful that intersectionality, you know, it, it means actually being able to talk about environmental issues that 
you know, people of color can identify with, that the young people can identify with based on their own experience and that can really bring out their knowledge, their wisdom, their, their sense of having future careers and, you know, leadership roles. I mean, I think that's an amazing way to um, understand intersectional approaches among the, the many great points you also made in, in your response. And uh, we have a, a question uh, from a current PhD student, <laughs> um, and uh, they, they were, or they are sort of responding to, uh, or kind of building off of the parts of the conversation when you were talking about how mainstream environmental goals can uh, can sometimes be extractive, um, you know, such as people that are focused on aggregate emissions reductions, and so they're kind of re responding to to that thread, and 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 they're asking that from their standpoint as a PhD student, uh, what do you think are some of the new roles that are needed in the next five to 10 years to develop and implement climate justice uh, uh, in the US? Will those roles be in government or at the grassroots level or both or elsewhere? Mm, thank you. Yes, that's an awesome question. So one role that I found to be critical is one where not necessarily, although certainly we need more folks in government to be, to be, because so I, I uh, recently been talking to FERC as they have developed this Office of Public Participation, mm -hmm. and also talking to the Department of Interior and others as they've been, because they've all been charged with these, these executive orders to have what they call, like they have this Justice 40 initiative, which says that 40% of uh, infrastructure programming needs to benefit quote unquote disadvantaged communities. And um, so as we talk about how to make that happen, one of the things that we've talked about being needed is that the government agencies need to be, you know, somehow re re uh, reformed or I don't know, revised in some way that's actually gonna have a better bridge to those communities then than there, there exists now. So whether it's the FERC, the Federal Energy um, Regulatory Commission and their Office of Public Participation, like what does that mean? Like now they have this office and but how do they bridge that to make sure the communities are actually accessing it? We talk about the Justice 40, how are we making sure that we're not just kind of setting this kind of disadvantaged community standard, but like basically any community along a spectrum meets that meets that criteria and therefore the communities that are so disenfranchised that they haven't changed over the years, whether it's been Ford or Carter or Reagan or Clinton or Obama or anyone who has ever been in office, like some of the Freedmen settlements we work with that are that were founded by emancipated enslaved persons. We work with one community that has never had running water since emancipation. And it's 14 year, 14 miles outside of Dallas, which is one of the richest communities in the country. So that's all to say. We need, you know, in the federal government, one of the roles that we need is to have in each and every agency, a whole suite of people that are bridging the gap between these federal agencies and what their goals are in actual communities that, that need to access and influence. And then another role, I'll, I know, because I don't want to give too long of an answer to one question, but another role that we need is in terms of bridging is bridging clim climate science with frontline communities. So one of the things that, one of the people that we work with a lot is Climate Central, which does a lot around, um, helping people to be able to forecast uh, sea level rise in their communities. They do a lot around meteorology and so forth. And so we work with them to develop apps, tools, trainings, and so forth to help communities to be able to be what they used to call citizen scientists in term, instead of citizen became you know kind of a fraught term, but community scientists. And so helping communities to be able to use the technology, use the, the science to be able to build smart climate action is another role that we absolutely need. And then we also just, I'll just say finally, that we also need everyone to be a lot more, you know, whatever role people are in, whether it's a geologist who has a lot more of an understanding of of um, of kind of who, who who has an orientation around looking at the uh, the intersection of fracking and and earthquakes or whether you're uh, you know so all the different 
professions out there, we need people to have more of an orientation towards looking at climate impacts and also looking at it from a social justice lens. I just gave a talk to the 450 authors who will be writing the next national climate assessment. And in that talk, it was a lot about like helping them to see in each and every one of those chapters that they're writing, what the environmental justice impacts were. And, and so we need folks to be able to, to, to understand some, you know, from whatever seat they're sitting in um, in order to, to get that intersectionality that we talked about earlier. <laughs> um, because yeah, we need our programming to be a lot more integrated and, um, and informed by intersectionality. So hopefully that a long answer to a short question. Hey, if, if, <laughs> if, if I would have only heard what you just said when I was a student. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that would have been powerful just all the different roles and you know possibilities for people to um you know apply themselves and to take leadership and uh uh yeah hopefully the person that uh asked a question or, or others yeah in a few years when you decide <laughs> what you're going to do shoot me a note <laughs> I'm, I'm curious <laughs> that, that's a lot of great um ideas and and futures and our, our our next um colleague who has a question so it has to do with this sort of distinction, which I don't know if you if you use this distinction or if you uh, uh, like to speak about climate change in, in other ways, but a sort of distinction about adaptation and mitigation. Mm -hmm. And in the the question, you know, they're, they're they're talking about how you know so much of climate change involves you know focusing on uh, emissions. Uh, but, you know, the IPCC and other scientific bodies say that we're locked into some some warming. There's going to be uh, risks and 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 obviously many communities, especially uh, communities of color, you know, are already experiencing uh, many harms uh, due to climate change. Mm -hmm. And so they ask, you know, have you seen the conversation start to shift to adaptation, uh, you know, in terms of climate justice, um, you know, whether you have or, 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 or have it, you know, what should a conversation look like that addresses, you know, uh, what I'll just call for now, you know, adaptation uh, in relation to the need to, to mitigate? Uh. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. Um, yeah, so several years ago when I felt like, yeah, like I felt like hardly anybody was focused on adaptation, but yet I had, one of the entry points for me into doing environmental climate justice work was having volunteered for six weeks in the post Katrina situation and um, starting to do more around volunteering after disasters. And so with that, I really started to kind of see that climate change is already here and that we need to start getting it together um, in terms of uh, preparing folks for it because it's the, yeah, anyways, for the reasons that the person stated. And so so I really started to push forward on adaptation, you know, back then, um, 12 years ago when I first started working at NACP, and then um, and then even within the movement, there were people who were who were against talking about adaptation because it was um, it was because they felt like it was kind of passively accepting that our communities are going to, you know, the people aren't going to, 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 to try to stem the tide of climate change. So they want our communities to adapt instead of focusing on stopping it from happening in the first place, which I, you know, you know, I got, but I was also like, it's already happening, you know, and you know, and, and I don't see us like building up the political will as much as we would love to have the political will to turn on a dime and stop em emitting. I don't see that in the trajectory and we really have to start getting our folks ready to deal with this. So anyway, so this, this is a bit of a challenge there. But fast forward to today where we realize that it's already here. We realize that we're not going to be able to, you know, there's a couple of, there's many, many things where they're both adaptive and mitigating. And then there's also, so when we talk about our local, our food systems, for example, having local food systems starting to create, to, to, to do local production of food is both mitigating because we know that, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, commercial feeding operations or, it is the shipping and trucking of food, you know, so somebody has to have kiwi or whatever it is that people want. Um, so all the shipping and trucking of foods and 
and all the things that that's involved in kind of mass production and movement of food. If we start having local food, it, it, it takes away from the emissions that are tied to food, but then it also helps us to be able to, to be more resilient to, to the shifts in agricultural yields that, we'll, we, that we see in the context of climate change. And so there's a lot of different ways that, that these are different ways that we need to, and so even with, um, with uh, clean energy, for example, when there was the big polar vortex, I forgot, they call it snow apocalypse or whatever, uh, a few years ago in the Northeast, um, I was working with someone, I mean, I was staying stranded at a hotel, the hotel didn't have electricity, and the person who was running the restaurant said that her home on her block was the only home that still had lights. And it was because she had solar plus storage. And uh, people, everyone kind of kept from the neighborhood kept knocking on her door, like, how do you have lights? And she's like, I'm not on the grid, <laughs> you know, and I've got solar plus storage. And so there's all these different ways that, um, that mitigating is also adapting and, um, and, and actually, now that you asked that question, I should I should probably think about putting something out that talks about talks about how a lot of the different practices combine mitigation and adaptation. But even even the things that don't necessarily explicitly integrate mitigation, like the work that um, is happening around managed retreat um, and infrastructure building uh, for folks who are going to be inundated by sea level rise. You know, we're now having the push for funding to go towards this, recognizing that, you know, that we, we, you know, we, we, we fail to stop emitting. So now we have to take responsibility for people who are in harm's way as a result of it. And so those are the tough, tough conversations that need to happen as well. So hopefully that kind of, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, but, I mean, it, well, it brought back a lot of memories from uh, earlier in my, um, you know, career when I was starting out, and I was aware that, you know, there were many communities, you know, some several decades ago, they were already planning for resettlement. And if I brought up those adaptation issues, yeah. a lot of white environmentalists would like scold me or others and say, don't even speak of that, you know, right. and it was just like, yeah, we all, we, we, we have to, to mitigate, but you have to acknowledge uh, right. the, the risk and the suffering that's already occurring. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, you gave uh, amazing voice to just <laughs> how we need to look really holistically about these issues. Um, you know, Jackie, the, the, the next question um, uh, and, and what might be our, our final exchange uh, for our session today has to do with some of the institutions that matter to black communities. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the colleague asks, uh, what suggestions might you extend uh, to groups in the black community, such as sororities, fraternities, churches, and mosques, uh, to have an impact on climate justice uh, uh, in in our communities. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, that's all. That's a lot to answer in the few minutes remaining. But I'll say very briefly that a that that's exactly what um, what what we've been talking about is multi solving because we know that our communities have so much that's going on that um, we really have to make sure that the the intersection the intersectionality of of our analysis has to be met with the intersectionality of our of our uh, responses, and so yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and so when we when we were visiting, for example, one of the communities, they were like, "Yeah, you know, we respect that you're doing that environmental stuff, but what we're trying to deal with is, you know, joblessness and criminal justice in our communities." And I, so then I said, "Oh well, great, we happen to have a project where it's called the Power of Employment Project, where it's actually." training formerly incarcerated persons in energy efficiency retrofits and solarization and so they were like all over it because it was multi-solving you know and it met them where they were in terms of the things that they cared about and they combined it with the climate mitigation and adaptation approach and so for each and every one of those groups the mosques the churches the it, we, we're always about meeting people where they are and, um, you know, so, and, and, um, and then figuring out what's going to meet all of these interests. So like when we saw, I mentioned the Portland Clean Energy Fund, but the, the Future Energy Jobs Act and the clean energy um, uh, legislation that just passed in Illinois was because they had a great table, a coalition table that where all the different interests were met, now, the returning citizens groups, the, the faith groups and so forth, they all kind of said, 
here's what's going to meet our our needs or our concerns and they put together these intersectional pieces of legislation that are multi-solving that solve for all these problems in concert and so that's been really critical to to engaging folks in our community it's something that's going to address the myriad issues that we face on a day-to-day -day basis yeah no i i appreciate it and you know uh jackie uh we, we gotta go. <laughs> I wanted to, 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 to thank you. I, I wanted to, to thank you just for your great sharing of all your knowledge and wisdom and just your philosophies and you know perspectives are you know ones I know are gonna stick with so many of us for a long time. And so obviously wanted to thank you. And in Nishnabe language, we say miigwech. Uh, and I wanted to just uh, invite my uh, colleague Shobita back into the space to further uh, thank you and close our time together for the session. Thanks again, Jackie. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kyle. Uh, and thank you very much, Jackie. This is such a wonderful, fascinating, um, intellectually stimulating conversation. Um, we, as you saw, we got lots of questions in the chat and, and so our participants, I think, were as excited as we were to have you. So I'm so thrilled that you were able to join us today. Um, and so um, that concludes our first uh, event in the STPP um, lecture series. Uh, as I said at the outset, stay tuned for our second event of the semester, which will be in a couple of months on December 6th, uh, where we'll have uh, Fatima Hassan in conversation with Dr. Abdul El Sayed talking about health justice issues. Thanks again, and we will see you soon. Take care.